If you don't know who I am, I'm Rick Thorpe, and I'm the rector here, and we're going to be looking at the vision of the church. We've prayed into it a little bit, and now I'm going to tell you a little more detail about that, which is exciting. I'm excited about it, and as we prepare for that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for our church. Thank you that we're part of a big, massive church all around the world. And we thank you that you have called us to play our part in seeing the kingdom of God grow. Thank you for the privilege of being involved in your work. And we pray this evening, as we explore this passage in the book of Acts, that you would speak into our own lives, Lord. You'd speak into our situations, into um, our, uh, into our faith, into our relationship with you but also into the part that you want us to play in this vision. We pray for those who are both members here, but also those who are visitors, Lord, that you would inspire us. You'd open our eyes to what you want to do with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, East London, isn't it a fantastic place to be? Yeah? Um, We have really enjoyed being in East London um, over the last few years, but particularly this summer. It's just been a fantastic summer. We just, I think we happened to be in way in France when it wasn't very nice weather here. Um, but we, I just, it seems to be like I've had two or three months, just fantastic weather. I've got a great tan. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, just been an amazing summer here. The, the Olympics, the Paralympics, the, the, the whole investment into this area has been extraordinary. Um, our family went cycling yesterday from here. I think we spent about 30 seconds on a road. And the rest of the time we were cycling along the canals and waterways past the Olympic Park back around um, Victoria Park and down the Regent's Canal. It's absolutely amazing what they've done. And it's just, it is, it's just an extraordinary, amazing place. It's full of vitality. There's some um, amazing people around. And it's just a great place to live. Shadwell and East London, you know, let's hear it for them. They're amazing, aren't they? So, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but you scrape underneath the surface, scratch under the surface, and actually all is not well. The deeper things, you know, we can put billions of pounds into regeneration, but actually under the surface, it doesn't change the human heart. And there is um, just a lot of um, problems around here. Economically, we know, obviously, about the city. Um, it's difficult for people finding work. Uh, I was just talking to someone this morning who's lost their work and just find, trying to find work. And that's a reality for many people. But... Um, at the same time, you've got child poverty just across the road, the highest um, child poverty in the country in that ward, just on the north side of the highway. Number one, that statistic. There's obviously material poverty, but there's um, emotional poverty as well. You look at things like there's loneliness around. You know, we've got one of the most crowded parts of London, and people don't know their neighbour. You knock on the door, and, and actually, you know, people. There's one person I've uh, I knock on the doors of these houses quite regularly. And there's one person who just has the door open like this much, and then he goes, "Oh, it's you," and then closes the door. <laughs> um, and um, he just doesn't like seeing anyone at all. But there's there's this kind of almost a, a deeper loneliness where people don't just don't get to know their neighbours at all, and um, it's just so sad. And it does something in a city. It actually begins to affect the life of the city. And spiritually, you know, materialism doesn't work. Secularism is just beginning to be strained at the edges, you know, with, you know, across the whole country. There's a growing interest in spirituality. But people just don't know where to turn. They don't know where to look. They're fed up with the institutional um, answers that um, just aren't helping them to find what they're looking for. There's a kind of growing restlessness and growing searching. And so whilst it's a great place in some ways to live, it's a very difficult place for many people to live. I want to ask the question today, to this evening, how can a city and a whole area, a region, be transformed? Not just superficially on the surface, but underneath, in, people's, in the deep parts of people's lives, in the communities, in relationships, in the way we interact with one another. Just as we look into this, we're going to dive into Acts to see how Paul um, witnessed and saw from his um, calling and his work how a whole area was transformed. 
But for us here, we as a church, um, you know, we're in a building that's 200 years old. There's been a church here for 350 years. And um, 356 years ago, um, the church said we need a new church in this area to, to begin to reach out to the Docklands of that time. And so they planted this church. It was a church that began to grow and be effective in different ways, reaching out to a whole range of different kinds of people who were associated with the dock trade um, in um, East London. Church fell down. This church was built in 1820 with Waterloo money um, from that victory. And then the church kind of has gone through various stages. And church, not, not building, but people in this church. And um, the biggest, most challenging time this church has faced was in um, just in the latter half of last century, where there are huge demographic changes in this area. The East Enders, a lot of um, the work that was for the East Enders after the um, Second World War, this place was absolutely trashed with bombing, and the work moved east to Tilbury, where the docks um, uh, provided for deep sea, um, di you know, deep draft uh, container vessels. So all the younger people in this area moved out to where the work was, leaving the older indigenous East Enders behind. At the same time, there was an immigrant um, uh, population of uh, Bangladeshi Muslims who began to start coming into this area. And um, they, they're into, well into their second generation here already. Uh, since the 80s, with Canary Wharf development being built, this area's been transformed, a lot of regeneration as well. And um, a lot of young professionals live and work in this area. So proportionately, roughly, it's about 10% indigenous EastEnders, about 45% uh, Bangladeshi people, and about 45% young um, incoming professional people. That's the area. And the church just couldn't handle that change. They were really focused on those EastEnders. So in 2004, there were about 10, 12 people left in this church. So church 100 yards over there, Church of England Church. There's another one about 400 yards over there, another one 500 yards over there. We've kind of got a lot of Church of England churches around here, um, all aiming at that same group of people. And so the bishop said, well, I'm going to have to close you. It was such a storm um, from the, those 10, 12 people. They're, they're going to, don't mess with EastEnders. And um, they, um, they persuaded the bishops to save the church. And he just said, right, we're going to have a church plant. We're going to have something which is different. And so he invited Holy Trinity Brompton in West London to plant a church here. By planting a church, that means sending a group of people who are going to start something new as a church. And so 100 people came to do something in 2005, January. Um, our family came, my children, who were six, four, and two, uh, were number 98, 99, 100. And um, they were part of the team. And we just had an amazing team. 80 of them already lived in East London. They were kind of commuting across to um, Holy Trinity Brompton, but they... Um, thought a, a shorter commute would be rather nice. But 20 people who were in our connect group in West London came and joined us. They moved house, some of them sold houses to come with us to start this new church. So there's a high degree of commitment um, and involvement and um, things started with a bang. And it was um, a, you know, something for us to get used to, for the local churches to get used to. Um, but the local people began to see that something was going on. And um, we've uh, been making relationships and making connections since then. That was seven and a half years ago. And God has been growing us. This service was planted from the morning service. And um, we're continuing to grow. 2010, we had the privilege of being invited to, to send teams to two other churches in Tower Hamlets, in Bethnal Green and in Bow. And we've just been praying into a third church plant into the uh, Isle of Dogs, Millwall. So Ed and Fuzz are going to be planting a, a congregation, a new congregation uh, from here in January, which we are really, really excited about. And obviously it's a great loss to see Ed and Fuzz and the team who uh, God's raising up at the moment go. But at the same time, we can just see the influence of the kingdom of God spreading in different ways. They're going to be joining some fantastic churches that are already around the Isle of Dogs. And we want to play our part alongside them to see the kingdom grow and grow and make an impact on that local community. So our vision overall, we want to see, a vision is a, you know, something you see with your eyes. We want to see Shadwell and East London transformed by the love and power of Jesus. I want to see it transformed. What does transformation look like? It looks like that loneliness being changed where people begin to have friendship. It looks like families that have broken up 
being knit back together again. It looks like actually people where there's kind of huge unemployment, actually that beginning to change because God has raised up entrepreneurs and creative people to create work. It's about people becoming Christians. It's about people coming to know the God who made them. It's about people who've been bound up in fear and superstition and, um, and difficulty in their lives being set free. That is transformation. It's about some of the um, barriers in our neighborhood being broken down because of love. The love of God being shed abroad in people's hearts. That starts with the Christian community and it, and it creates waves that impact um, a whole area. That's what we want to see. It's not going to happen overnight. We are going to be here for longer than a lot of the institutions around. We've been here for 350 years. We're going to be here for another 350 years plus. We're going to play our part in seeing that transformation take place. How are we going to do it? Well, we've heard about making disciples, transforming communities, and planting churches. That's at the heart of how we're going to do it. And let's dive in to see how Paul can teach us some stuff about those things. So Ephesus, let's have a map of Ephesus up. Ephesus is on western, the western edge of Turkey, and um, it's a, uh, it was a city. It's no longer, it doesn't really exist anymore. There's a couple of stone pillars left, but it was a thriving city in that empire at that stage. It wasn't the capital of that area, but it was probably the most prominent city for two reasons. Economically, it was on a river um, just by the sea, and so it was a great trading port. Secondly, culturally, it was uh, the home of the Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. This temple was absolutely enormous. Um, and when you, uh, you know, if you visited Ephesus, it would be totally dominating the whole of the city. There wouldn't be a bit like the Shard. You, know, you wouldn't be able to go down a place without seeing this building. I'm trying to get away from the Temple of Artemis. You can't because it's too big. So that was the, the, the situation. It was dominated by that. And so the cultural and spiritual impact of this temple affected the whole way of life in the city. People were bound up in fear and superstition because of their cult following of this goddess. And Paul arrives in Ephesus on his third missionary journey, um, traveling um, around Europe. And he decides to stay in this city and to make disciples. He decides to stay and make a difference. And most other places he's been to, he's only spent a few weeks maybe a month, in one, city, in one church, Corinth, one and a half years. Here, he stays there three years. There's significance in the amount of time he invests in this place. And Acts 19, the one we've had read to us, is the story of the birth of the church in Ephesus and the impact of that church over a, not just that city, but over a whole region. We see in this chapter how God transformed a city and a whole region with the love and power of Jesus. So first of all, our vision is that we're called to make disciples. Jesus' command to the disciples was, in Matthew 28, his last words, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. And we see here Paul doing just that. At the beginning of Acts 19, he goes, he, he, um, he enters the city and he finds some disciples, verse 1. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And it, it transpires, they haven't really heard about Jesus. They've heard about John the Baptist who preceded Jesus. And they've followed him. They've, they've, they've said, we, we're sorry, God, we want to follow you. But it's just left at that. And Paul, recognizing this, there's something missing, he, he um, begins to tell them about Jesus, and they respond. They're open to the Lord. And as they respond, he then prays for them to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. They're baptized, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to exercise, even then, spiritual gifts. They um, speak in tongues and prophesy. And there were 12 men in all, the beginnings of a church, 12 people, right at the beginning of, um, you know, just in the first few days of Paul entering um, Ephesus. And so the heart of discipleship is evangelism. We've been focusing on evangelism this last year, sharing the gospel. How do we do that? How can we get to know our neighbors to share our faith? How can we, um, 
you know, st stir up our own understanding of the Christian faith so we can communicate it with those around us. That's the beginnings of discipleship. And we see here Paul preaching to those people. Um, he then goes to the synagogue, as was his practice in verse 8, and speaks boldly there for three months. He's preaching again. And we see him arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. So in his evangelism, he is not just speaking in public, but he's debating with people. He's um, wrestling with the Christian faith. He's trying to answer people's questions. What happens is that um, the Jewish people get a bit fed up with him. They say, and some obviously followed him, but others say, we've had enough, and they, um, he leaves. They've actually been publicly um, maligning the Christian faith. And do you know something? Every time you begin to start sharing your faith, there will be um, some antagonism. There will be people who don't like it, and they will speak up. And the challenge, as the challenge was with Paul, is what are you going to do? Are you just going to stop? Are you going to just um, be frightened about the response? Or are you going to keep going and just find out where there is fertile ground, where there are open ears to hear the good news about Jesus? God wants to, to use us to share the faith of Jesus with those around us. Where there's an opposition, don't worry about the opposition. Recognize that's all part and parcel of it. Expect it. But actually look around for, um, you know, ask the question of the Lord. Lord, who is open then? Who are the people who want to hear? And Paul takes these people to a, a, a local college nearby. So the lecture hall of Tyrannus. That's a bit like Shadwell College down the road. So he takes them there. And um, this went on for two years. So he begins to start not just keeping on speaking, preaching, not not just continuing to persuade people, but he's kind of debating, he's teaching, he's training these new disciples and people who are still interested in the, in, in the Christian faith. It's one of the reasons we run Alpha here. We want to help people to um, hear about the Christian faith, but also to have that chance to ask questions about it. People are inquisitive. They want, they've got questions. They've come with loads of years of questions, and they need them answered. That's why Alpha is so amazing. It's a chance to explore the meaning of life, the Christian faith. It's a, it's a chance to ask any question. And I want to encourage everyone who, anyone who hasn't done Alpha, come on our Alpha course. We're trying to encourage anyone in the church who hasn't done it to come. It's going to be a fantastic course. And it's a great chance for, um, to invite friends, invite friends, family, neighbors, um, colleagues to come along to this course. If you have done it before, bring other people along. It's going to be an amazing course. It starts mid-October. In just six weeks, we've shortened it to make it slightly more accessible. And we'd love to invite you and encourage you to come. It's not just, though, proclamation and persuasion. We see Paul here praying and exercising the power of the Spirit. Look at verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. I love this, so that even the handkerchiefs and aprons that touched them were taken to those who were ill, and their illnesses were healed. They were cured. Evil spirits left them. So just the very clothes that Paul wore had an impact on the people around him. Now, we're not exercising that kind of power yet, but wouldn't that be amazing, even just to see some people healed? When someone is healed in a community, everyone gets to hear about it. It is a fantastic way of um, people encountering God. People start asking questions. Who did that? How did that happen? How is that possible? And it's easy to be able to say, God did that. Let's talk about it. Power and prayer. We want to stir these things up in us. When, in our disciple making, we want to be able to say, it starts with evangelism. We want to keep on emphasizing this amongst us so that we can equip one another and help one another. But Paul doesn't stop there. He taught and trained his disciples. So we see him with these newly converted disciples. He takes them to the, um, hall, of, the hall of Tyrannus in verse 9. So he's doing public evangelism, and he's training, he's training his, these new disciples, saying, watch me, watch what I'm doing, and I'm going to teach you. He's also encouraging them and helping them. Just turn over the page to um, Acts 20, verse 31. This is where Paul is saying goodbye to the um, leaders of the um, Ephesian church. And he says this, just a, a, few, a phrase that um, shows us something more about what he was doing. So be on your guard, verse 31. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. 
wanting each of you. He's not just doing group studies and group training. He's doing it one by one. He's doing mentoring. He's doing um, individual discipleship with these um, Christians and these leaders. So we see what Paul is establishing is, is like a, is a discipleship base camp. He's got these young people who are new Christians. He's training them up. He's investing time both together in a group but also one by one, teaching them, training them in the faith. And they are um, just growing and growing. We see um, you know, leaders being trained. Look at verse 22. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia. So people who he's trained are actually being sent out from this base camp in order to do more of the work. And this year at St. Paul's, we want to deepen our culture of discipleship. We want to get better and better at discipleship. And we're in this together. I feel like I'm, in, and I'm an infant in this, um, in terms of training and encouraging and replicating um, the kind of work that Paul was doing so that we can have an impact like he did, just in a three-year period, just seeing a multiplying of discipleship across the church. That means that we need to help each other. Just keep a finger in there and turn over to 2 Timothy. This is a verse that's um, worth remembering. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. It's on page 1130 of the church Bibles. 1130. 2 Timothy 2. Paul, writing to Timothy, probably from a prison um, in Rome, probably in the last days of his life, um, and he says this, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So we've got a discipleship process going on here. As Paul, the things you heard me say to you, Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, there's a number of other people as well. Timothy, you entrust these things to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach. So you're equipping people who you have been trained and who are leaders to teach others. Paul, Timothy, reliable people, others. Four stages of discipleship. So Paul was teaching his disciples not just um, to be disciples, not just to follow Jesus, to have a devotional life, to um, serve in, in the church and um, in the world, to um, share their faith. But also, he was teaching them to make disciples. But it went beyond that. He was teaching them to be disciples, to make disciples who make disciples. It's a... It's like a shift for us. It's moving from being a follower of Jesus. I'm really trying to get my walk with God right. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. To take that step to say, I'm going to help others to be disciples. I'm going to make disciples. The key twist in the tale is to say, I'm going to make disciples who will make disciples. How does that happen? Well, in our making disciples, we need to um, start asking questions of those who we are trying to encourage. So we might be saying, you know, how's it going? How's your prayer life? You know, how are you able to, um, you know, are you being a, a good boy, good girl at work? You know, whatever it is, you know, in your relationships, how are you doing? Are you um, processing those things in a, a kind of gracious and righteous way and so on? We, you know, in, however we do that. But the key question, the clincher is, who are you discipling? So as I disciple someone, I'm encouraging them to disciple someone else. When you do that, it multiplies discipleship in just an extraordinary way. That's what we want to do this year. We want to explore how we do that. We want to equip each other with simple tools, simple questions, it might be, that we can ask each other to encourage each other to grow in our faith, but with that little twist at the end. And how are you discipling someone else? How's it going? That is a discipleship culture for all of us. I'm so grateful to God for the Pauls in my life, the people who have discipled me. I've still got friends who are discipling me. I'm so grateful to God for them. I've had the privilege of spending time with others, discipling them, and I continue to do that. And I'm really excited about the chance to say, not just the people I'm discipling, but to say, and who are you discipling? How's that going? 
a multiplication of discipleship. What was the result of this discipleship base camp? Well, look at verse 10. It was effective in evangelism. All the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All of them. What an extraordinary achievement of this discipleship base camp. Effective in evangelism and effective in discipleship. Look at verse 21. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. So after three years of doing this, he feels quite relaxed about leaving them to it and going to other places because he knows that he's established a culture of discipleship which is self-replicating. He's been effective. Here at St. Paul's, the best way to get into discipleship is to be in a connect group. There's a connect group. Um, Andrew and Megan's connect group just had a weekend away. That's a great example of a, a connect group that's kind of just really um, going for it and um, having fun together. There's another one, Charlie and Katie. have got a great connect group, a number of different connect groups, John and Krista. Um, join a connect group. Darren's got a connect group. Four to choose from, even from this service. Connect groups are our midweek groups that meet to know one another and be known, where we can explore together a deeper relationship with God, where we can encourage each other to be better disciples, and where we're going to start asking the question, and who are you discipling? Making disciples. Secondly, we're called to transform communities. Now, Ephesus was a city that was captivated by this cult of Artemis. And um, there was so much fear and superstition around. You can see that in these stories where you've got um, almost, a, you know, people amazed by, um, by Paul's um, healing ministry, but also these, um, this deliverance situation that we read about, son, seven sons of Sceva. And, um, I mean, it's an extraordinary story. If these people are, that, you know, the, the reason they failed was because they're not children of God. They didn't have the authority to exercise the name of Jesus in the, way, in the way that they were. They knew there was power there, but as soon as um, push came to shove, they weren't children of God. They didn't have the authority that was given to them by God, as we do. As children of God, we have that authority. But just the scene, I mean, it just is, you know, just a few words. They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Man, that must have been quite a situation they encountered. I mean, this man, who's kind of quite obviously completely possessed by demons, has um, pulled all their clothes off and scratched them to bits so that they're, you know, seven of them are, are kind of running around Ephesus um, uh, kind of slightly the worse for wear. Um, but the interesting thing is the impact. Verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in, in Ephesus, they were seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. You know, for... Um, you know, this is a challenge for us to live our faith out in a more public way. Paul lived his faith out in a public way and encouraged his disciples to do that so that people started to pray the way they were praying. People started knowing about Jesus and, and honoring his name in a public way. That's a challenge for us, to live out our faith in our communities in a more public way. Look at what happens when that happens. So um, uh, verse 18, many of those who now came, who believed, now came and openly confessed what they'd done. So people are publicly confessing sins. I haven't seen that in a place before. Public confession of sin. I've read about it in revivals in the past in the, in the UK. But this is what happens when Christians get out into the community. It makes a difference. People's lives begin to change. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. Value, 50,000 drachmas. Drachma is a, a day's wages, so it calculates around five, five million pounds worth of documents that were um, burnt in public. Extraordinary. That's, that is repentance. That is a 180 degree turn from a practice that is wrong to following God. In a public way, what happens? Verse 20, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. When Christians live out their faith in the public square, there may be opposition, but it will spread. It will grow in impact. It is unstoppable. Here in Shadwell, many people are bound in poverty. They're bound. They can't get out of the poverty that they're in. 
Some are bound in loneliness. They can't get out of their own flats. They don't know how to communicate with their neighbors. They, they are, just feel totally isolated and can't break free from that. Spiritually, there are people who um, are just blind to Jesus. There, is, there are many Muslims, there are many you know, East Enders, there are many professional people who just don't know Jesus. We need to live out our faith in the community. When we do that, it will be transformed. God has led us to go and have partners in this community, to get together with Food Bank, Night Shelter, City Gateway. Um, City Gateway finds jobs for young people where um, there is huge unemployment um, and equips them and trains them to be able to get into that workplace. Um, uh, there's the Death Advice Ministry here helping people out of uh, money problems. Uh, there's um, XLP, a youth charity, connecting with the, the, the most um, challenged youth. We've got Energizer, which is a local children's project, helping connect and just provide activities for children where there are none. We have partners, and we need to continue to grow these partnerships. But this next year, we're going to be consolidating this work. We want to focus it so that we can tackle the key issues that are around in Shadwell. We want to see that number one child poverty and shadow change. That's not going to happen on our, you know, we, that's going to change on our watch. While God has put us here, we want to see that change. We want to focus our work with these partners so that we can do that. We can see that begin to change through prayer, through activity, through relationship, through working together. It's going to be with partners like that. It's going to be with local churches. But God is working with us in this area. And when that begins to happen, when we focus our attention in a gospel way, gospel-minded way, the community is going to change. We're going to see this area change. People are going to see the love of Christ in you as you begin to get involved in these things and, and see this change. We're called to make disciples, transform communities. Lastly, we're called to plant churches. Just take a look at verse 10. I want to ask a question, how this happened. For two years, just must have been just over two years, because the overall time that Paul spent with the Ephesians was three years. Um, he says this, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. How? How did that happen? Do you know something? Paul never left Ephesus in three years. He stayed in the city for three years. We um, hear that he went from household to household teaching, but he never left the city. How did the whole of Asia hear the gospel? Well, the way he did it was he planted churches from Ephesus. During this time, and Matt will come up showing these places, churches were planted in Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. None of these churches were planted by Paul. They're all planted by other people who Paul trained. Paul didn't even, you know, when he writes the letter to the Colossians, he makes it clear in the letter that he's never even been to Col Colossae. They'd never seen his face, this church. And yet he's able to say, I've labored night and day praying for you. The church in Colossae and Laodicea and Hierapolis were planted by Epaphras. Epaphras was um, a, a Christian who um, became a Christian in Ephesus. He was trained and mentored by Paul so that within three years of bec becoming a Christian, he was planting churches in these other cities. Churches that began to make disciples. Churches that began to reach out to their local communities, the local villages nearby, so that everyone heard the word of the Lord. That's how he did it, planting churches. And God has called us to be a church planting church. I think any church can plant a church, but God's called us to definitely plant churches. We, we've done it, we're going to keep doing it. The challenge for us is by um, January we'll have planted three churches and four including our own. How can we turn four into 40? We've got to change the way we do things. We've got to learn how to multiply the same way that Paul did, how we can plant churches that plant churches. This is not something which is for kind of um, 
scholars and that kind of thing. This is something for us. Some of you are going to be called to plant from here, to go elsewhere. Tears will be shed, will be sad. Many of you will be called to stay here and to keep, um, to, to keep planting churches from here, to keep that this strategic place so that we can keep doing that. But wherever God has called you to be, whatever it is that he's called you, calling you to do, we've got to get into church planting because it's the only way that the whole area will begin to hear the gospel. We've got churches all over the place, but we haven't got enough churches. In this parish, there are no other churches. We're the only one. It's extraordinary. 4,000 people. St. Paul's Chapel's the only one. We've got to start planting churches in our parish. In Tower Hamlets, actually, there are very few churches for the 280,000 people who live here. We've got to start planting churches. In, you, that's um, one borough. You think about East London. Just talking to someone earlier this evening, we've got the orange line going down. Um, we can plant churches down that line. We can plant churches along the DLR. We can plant churches across the central line. It's not to say that, you know, St. Paul's shadow, ooh. Actually, it's that God is calling people here to plant churches, to get involved in that. That's exciting, isn't it? Seeing the word of God spread in an area, in a region. It doesn't mean that other people aren't doing it as well. We want the more, the merrier. But you know something? Statistically, between 2 and 5% of this country are Christian. There's a lot of work to do. We need to plant churches. Planting churches is hugely costly. It costs money, but it actually costs people. We need to send our best in order to plant churches. But these churches will begin to be starting to make disciples in new places, beginning to transform their communities and beginning again to plant churches in other places. That's how it happens. So, I mean, you can tell I love church planting. And, um, <laughs> and I'd love to invite, you know, I'm, I get more and more opportunities to... Um, to to be involved in training, but also in, involved in helping other churches. And if any of you ever want to come with me, please come, because you are part of this story. You can tell your part of the story. But I'd love to encourage you, anytime you want to come, please get in touch, and I'd love to take you with me. So together, as Paul encouraged these disciples, he trained them, he mentored them, he encouraged them to train and mentor others, he encouraged um, leaders to be raised up, church planters to be raised up, and we see this beginning to grow and grow and grow. That's what God is calling us to be and to do. That's really exciting. That's how Paul saw a whole region and a city transformed. That's what God is calling us to be and to do in Shadwell and East London. And I think that God wants every single one of us to be involved in this. Four ways to get involved. First of all, join in. It's very easy to be on the edges of things. And I want to encourage you to jump in to what's going on here. Join a connect group if you're not already in one. Join the Alpha course if you've never done it before. If you have done it before, you know what it's like, you know how good it is, bring friends to it. If you haven't been before, take a risk, bring friends and come with them. We want everyone to do Alpha if you haven't done it before. And join a connect group. That's on the blue cards. Andrew talked about it in the notices. SPS News. Fill in a blue card tonight. If you're not in a connect group, if you want to join Alpha, just um, fill in that. Join in. Second thing is to pray. Jesus encourages us to pray. Ask anything in my name and I will give it to you. You kind of think, oh, that's too good to be true. Most of us have never tried it. We have problems. We kind of think, oh, you know, why is God treating me like this? Have you prayed about that? Really prayed? Bill Hybels in a devotional today says, um, have you spent time urgently praying before God for 30 days every day? If you haven't, he's, he's, his encouragement is go and do it. Don't just say complain. Go and do it. See what happens. See if God is faithful and true. He is faithful and true. Pray. We need to encourage one another to pray daily ourselves. We have a weekly prayer meeting here. We have a bi-monthly um, evening kind of gathering as well. Come, pray. Pray and be a part of what God is wanting to do. Nothing's going to happen without prayer. And we need to pray for, um, pray for God's agenda to be worked out in practice. Join in, pray. Third thing is serve. Join a team. There are green cards around. 
And um, Ed, uh, Rod's going to be speaking about how we can involve looking at the book of um, Ephesians, uh, the letter to the Ephesian church um, next week. But join a team. There's a card here which you can just say, yeah, I'm going to join a team. I'm going to be a part of this. We need, right now, we need four new people for the children's church. We need four new people for the um, uh, sound and technical team. But that's if we're at the stage now. If we grow, we'll need more. There are people on the welcome team. If you're not in any team, why don't you start with the welcome team? Fantastic place to get to know other people and to join in and serve. Serving does a, a number of things. One is it, it's much more fun doing it with other people than doing it alone. The jobs get done much more effectively when more people get involved. And the third thing is it changes your heart. When you serve, it changes you. You might think, oh, I'm being really helpful for everyone else. Well, you are, but the most important thing is actually it's changing you. Serve. And finally, give. Give financially. Um, we're going to have a gift day in two weeks' time. And so don't go somewhere else in two weeks. <laughs> um, but if you are going somewhere else in two weeks, I'd love to encourage you to give before. So we have an extraordinarily generous church. You've raised something like £400,000 um, for the year. Uh, and that's an amazing, amazing thing. It is extraordinary. We have 90000 for the remaining three and a half months of the year to raise. And so I'd love to encourage you to give. If you, um, the main way we encourage people to give is by standing order. And um, that helps you plan. We're encouraged by Paul, actually in uh, 2 Corinthians, to plan our giving. Um, rather than just kind of finding what's the loose change in my pocket, is actually what is the proportion of the money that I earn that, um, I, uh, that God is calling me to give. It's a completely different way of thinking about giving. Do it prayerfully, with wisdom, thinking it through, looking at your budget. But starting, what can I give? And then looking at everything else in your budget. Do that. Please be doing that. And give to this church. Give to the work that's going on. If you believe, if you think the vision is worth going for, please give to it. With, you know, if you give already, have a look at your standing orders. Some people will need to um, reduce them because of changed circumstances. Others, you can increase them. Please do that. And you might like to give a one-off gift on that day as well. If you're not here, um, you know, please give in advance. That would be great so we can focus our giving on that particular time. And um, it's a fantastic thing. It's a great liberating thing to give financially to put God first in that area of your finances. But do it with wisdom. If you want to talk to someone about it, talk to Jackie. Jackie's over there, our treasurer. She's independently minded. I'm completely biased. Please give to us. Please give a lot. Um, <laughs> she can say, well, you know, you're massively in debt and you probably need to sort that out first or, um, you know, whatever it is. But actually talk to her and, and please do set up standing orders. That makes a huge difference. We get tax back on it as well, which is wonderful. The government likes to pay for the vision Two. So, how can a city in an area be transformed? It's by making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. It's by having those disciples involved in their community, transforming it. And it's by planting churches, some being prepared to up sticks and to go where God is calling them to be, to set up a new strategic discipleship base camp in another place in the city or in another city altogether. What an exciting call that is on us. And I'd love you to get involved in it as much as you can. There are visitors here today. Please pray for us, but also take some of those ideas back to your own church. God is doing something, not just here, but across lots of churches in this whole area of um, making disciples, of raising up leaders to plant churches. And I, I want to set that fire going in other places too. So we'd like to stand and let's pray together.